World War I changed the world forever, and it changed art forever. Long-standing rivalries between European nations, imperial ambitions, and a tangled web of alliances triggered a chain reaction of declarations and mobilizations in 1914 upon the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The world descended into chaos. The war saw the widespread use of trench warfare, new technologies like tanks, planes, and poison gas, and massive casualties on both sides. The human toll was immense, with millions of soldiers and civilians losing their lives or being severely wounded. As World War I raged on, a new art movement was brewing amid the chaos. Dadaism emerged as a response to the horrors of the war and the disillusionment with traditional values and art forms. The war shattered the conventional worldview and exposed the absurdity of the human condition. Artists couldn't find meaning in the senseless violence, and they struggled to convey the horrors through traditional art forms. Thusly, Dadaism immediately took on a very anti-war message. In a sense, Dadaists aimed to wage war against war. Dadaism also took on a very anti-art message, becoming a radical departure from established artistic techniques and principles. They reveled in the absurd, the irrational, and the nonsensical, embracing absurdity, randomness, and anti-establishment sentiments with open arms. Artists associated with Dadaism sought to challenge the traditional understanding of beauty and art's purpose, particularly in the face of such senseless violence and destruction. The war's brutality and the industrialization of warfare left deep scars on society's psyche. As a result, artists began questioning the very foundations of artistic expression and sought to create something entirely new. Dadaists believed that traditional art, with its rigid rules and adherence to beauty, had lost its relevance in the face of such destruction. On February 5, 1916, at the Cabaret Voltaire, a smoky café in the heart of Zurich, Switzerland, a group of young artists and thinkers came together to challenge traditional norms and embrace the absurdity of life, creating Dadaism. Artists and writers like Hugo Ball, Emmy Hennings, Tristan Tazara, Marcel Janko, and Hans Arp looked to assault the ideals of nationalism and patriotism that were contributing to the inhumane losses on the front lines. The Dadaists of that fateful night turned to nihilistic influences, believing that life lacked inherent meaning and art needed to reflect this reality. As Hugo Ball put it, every word that is spoken and sung here represents at least this one thing, that this humiliating age has not succeeded in winning our respect. Where Dada got its name, no one can really agree on. It's commonly accepted that the German artist Richard Hulsenbeck opened a random dictionary, ultimately landing on the French word for a rocking horse, Dada. Dada may have gotten its name from a baby's first words, an appealing origin point as it mirrored the absurdity that the Dadaists were going for. Or the word may have no meaning at all in any language, reflecting the group's internationalism. Hugo Ball, born in 1886 in Germany, was a poet and recited multiple Dadaist poems at the Cabinet Voltaire, like Carawan, which consisted entirely of incomprehensible sounds, not words with meaning. In the July of 1916, Hugo Ball took the stage at the Cabaret Voltaire and unleashed his famous Dada Manifesto. This manifesto was more than just a written statement. It was a radical performance piece that challenged the very essence of language and art. One excerpt reads, Dada world war without end, Dada revolution without beginning, Dada you friends and also poets, esteemed sirs, manufacturers and evangelists. Dada tsara, Dada huelsenbeck, Dada medada, Dada medada, Dada mahm, Dada der Dada, Dada hue, Dada tsa. By using nonsense words, sentence structures and avant-garde sounds in his manifesto and in his poems, Ball sought to liberate language from its oppressive constraints and embrace the irrational and spontaneous. This was the essence of Dadaism, a rebellion against reason and a celebration of chaos and chance. By 1918, 
The Romanian artist Tristan Zara had largely taken control of Zurich's Dada art scene and decided to publish his own manifesto that builds upon the foundation laid by Hugo Ball. Zara's manifesto, while still reflecting the spirit of chaos and rebellion against societal norms, took a different approach from Ball's. In his manifesto, Tazara critiqued the very idea of artistic creation and expression. He proclaimed that Dadaists should abandon any intention of making sense and instead embrace pure chance and spontaneity. Many of Zurich's Dadaists returned home following the November 11th Armistice in 1918, which effectively ended World War I, as well as Zurich's Dada art scene. However, these Dadaists brought the ideals of Dadaism along with them, allowing Dadaism to flourish elsewhere in Europe and even into America. Berlin became a new home for German Dadaists, like George Gross, Kurt Schwitters, Max Ernst, and John Hartfield, who organized the first international Dada fair in Berlin in 1920. In the years following World War I, the new Weimar Republic struggled with economic downturns and political instability as a result of the war. The collective traumatization, much like Dada, gave rise to new art movements like Neue Sachlichkeit, or New Objectivity, which expressed the bitter social criticism under those like Max Beckmann and Otto Dix. Dadaism in Germany took on a very political shape. German Dadaism gave birth to the photo montage. Hannah Hook was an important pioneer of this technique. She skillfully cut and combined images from magazines and newspapers to create thought-provoking collages addressing gender roles, feminism, consumer culture, and political issues. Her work challenged societal norms and set a new artistic precedent, giving Dada a defining visual characteristic. John Hartfield took the photo montage and ran with it. Featured wartime imagery, government figures, and political cartoon clippings, his works became known for their savage and satirical political caricatures, reflecting his disdain for war, militarism, and political corruption, well into the 1930s. Georges Gross was a painter, and his artistic approach was rooted in new objectivity. However, unlike many new objectivity artists who embraced a more objective style, Gross infused his works with a sense of grotesque distortion to underscore the absurdity of his subjects, a defining feature of Gross's art was his unapologetic depiction of corruption and moral decay within the ruling elite. During and after the war, New York City became an important hub for Dadaists seeking refuge. Marcel Duchamp was one of these artists. Marcel Duchamp was a French artist born in blainville crevon France, on July 28, 1887. Growing up in a family of artists, Duchamp inherited a keen interest in the arts from a young age. He also found talent as a cartoonist, creating verbal puns. Duchamp's early artistic career in Paris saw him experimenting with Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, much like many other artists of his time. Inspired by the fractured forms and multiple perspectives of Cubism leading into the 1910s, Duchamp started exploring the boundaries of representation. His groundbreaking painting, Nude, Descending a Staircase No. 2, created a sensation at the 1913 Armory Show in New York City. This deep-seated interest in the themes and exploration of sexual identity and desire led Duchamp toward Dadaism and Surrealism. In 1915, he immigrated to New York City and began experimenting with the idea of ready-mades. Duchamp took ordinary, manufactured objects and designated them as art. His bicycle wheel and bottle rack are prime examples of this. By taking mass-produced objects and elevating them to the status of art, Duchamp challenged the notions of originality and the role of the artist. One of Duchamp's most infamous ready-mades was Fountain, which he created in 1917. Fountain was, in essence, a simple urinal turned on its back and signed with the pseudonym R. Mutt. By designating such a simple, unusual object as art, Duchamp set an intriguing precedent that anything, no matter what it is, could be art. Duchamp did not lose his interest in the themes of sexual identity and returned in 1919 with L. Hook. This drawing added a mustache and goatee to a postcard of Leonard da Vinci's Mona Lisa.
This playful and irreverent gesture was a direct challenge to the cult of celebrity and traditional notions of beauty, further solidifying Dada's reputation as the rebellious vanguard of modern art. New York City's other Dadaists, notably Francis Picabia and Man Ray, were joined by new artists and writers like Beatrice Wood, Henri Pierre Roche, and Mina Loy. Much of their activity took place in the 291 Gallery and at the studio of Walter and Louise Ahrensberg. Their publications, such as The Blind Man, Wrong Wrong, and New York Dada, challenged conventional museum art with more humor and less bitterness than European groups. In Paris, Dadaism also persisted under the direction of Tristan Zara. Francis Picabia left Dadaism altogether upon accusing Paris and Dadaism of becoming the very thing it originally fought against. Infighting within the Paris group led to its collapse in 1923. With Picabia's exit, Dadaism as a whole began to decline. Dada's anarchic and nihilistic approach started losing its edge, and some artists felt the need to find new ways to express their visions and ideas. In 1924, André Breton published his first Surrealist Manifesto. Surrealists were fascinated by the unconscious mind, dreams, and the irrational. Their goal was to liberate the human psyche from the constraints of reality and embrace the fantastic. Many Dadaists began to shift their art styles towards Surrealism, and thus, Surrealism emerged as a natural evolution. <laughs> 